Thank you, Tom, for an inspiring talk and um, for your introduction. I'd like to take you back to some time quite long ago when I had actually just finished my PhD at Wharton in um, the University of Pennsylvania in the US. And I was um, about to join my first job. And my first job was at the University of Texas at Austin. And um, you know, I was on a plane to Austin, Texas, and I was extremely excited, as you can imagine, uh, to be joining my first job after many years of study. And um, Austin has beautiful weather, so it looked like that, that out of the plane window. And you know, the plane was coming down to land, and I was looking out of the window eagerly. And um, I started to see these specks on the landscape. So I could see round and diamond-shaped and oval-shaped green and blue, very glittering objects on the landscape. And I was just looking out of the window and thinking, gosh, what are they? What are they? And as the plane came closer to land, I realized that they were swimming pools. So I was amazed. I grew up in India and in New Delhi. It's very hot in New Delhi in summer. And I love swimming. And you know, as a child, I used to swim every morning in the summer. But I had never swum in a swimming pool without at least 50 other people in the pool <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> what does this image tell you about how these people interact? Very separate, very insular. That was my feeling as well when I saw this. And you know, I kept that memory with me. And um, only a few years ago, I was talking to uh, my dear friend and co-author, Elizabeth Teisberg. And she shared a memory from her childhood with me. So she had grown up in Minnesota, in a suburban uh, Minnesota neighborhood in the US. And uh, you know, the block she looked, uh, that she grew up on looked kind of like that block, typical um, suburban block. But she said the only difference in her block was that there were no fences amongst those backyards. So just imagine what that would be like. So usually you would have one or two fairly bored kids in each yard and maybe one parent or a nanny looking after the kids. Instead, they had eight or 12 children who were running around in this much bigger space. They had uh, enough space to have a big swing set. And often there'd only be one adult looking after all these kids. And also many of those kids are still friends. So if you think about it, it's a really different kind of interaction. And it was also interesting to Elizabeth and I because uh, we've spent several years studying the most innovative organizations, large corporates, startups, um, not-for-profits. And what we found is that often one thing that sets apart highly innovative organizations is simply how they interact. So whether you're thinking about how they interact with the client or the interaction with other entities, other organizations, or even the interaction within their own organization, they're different. But then if you think about how you interact, you know, we get up in the morning and we start to interact with people around us and uh, judging by what Tom said, probably talking faster and faster. <laughs> and, and then where, you know, you're on the way to your um, workplace, you would be interacting with people, you come to work and you start to interact. And often you don't really think too much before you start to interact. You know, it's pretty much hardwired, you just interact. So what I want you to do is to actually take a uh, 30 seconds to think back to an interaction which I'm sure each of you has had. I want you to think back to the last time that you had to go to see the doctor. Just think back to that. So probably you were feeling somewhat unwell. And so maybe you um, called the doctor's office. And then you, know, you got an appointment, you go to the doctor's office, you probably sat in some kind of lounge or lobby area and waited. And then finally, either they would call your name or your name would come on a screen. And then you would go into the doctor's office to have your one-on-one -on -one appointment with the doctor. Have you experienced this? 
So before I came to London Business School, um, I used to teach at the University of Virginia in the US at uh, the Darden School. I was there for 12 years. And at the University of Virginia, I met a doctor. Her name was Dr. Amy Tucker. And she was running a preventive cardiac care clinic. So what that means is that you wouldn't go to that clinic if you were actually having a heart attack, uh, God forbid. Uh, but you would go to that clinic if you had some of the risk factors for heart disease. So for example, uh, if you were overweight, or if you had high blood pressure, or if you had previously had a heart attack, you might want to go to that clinic. And uh, she is an extremely dedicated doctor. And she wanted to be able to serve as many patients as she could. She also wanted to serve each patient as well as she could, giving them the highest quality care. And so what she was finding is she was essentially running faster and faster and faster to do this. Have you felt that way sometimes about your job? So this feeling that you just, you know, you, the only thing you can do is run faster. And then what Amy Tucker decided is she decided, I'm going to do things differently. And so what she decided was to, instead of doing one-on-one -on -one appointment, she said, I'm going to do shared medical appointments. So what is this shared medical appointment? Basically, the way it was going to work is that whenever um, someone called and asked for an appointment in her clinic with Dr. Tucker, the um, assistant or the secretary would say, sure, yes, you can have your appointment with Dr. Tucker. And she, you know, this is a specialty appointment, so it would usually take four to six weeks. That's pretty common for a specialty appointment. Um, or you can come tomorrow and be in a shared appointment. So what is this shared appointment? Let me show you. Um, this is actually Dr. Tucker's clinic. You can see there's uh, six or seven patients sitting around a table, and there's some, a few other um, couple of people in those lab coats, a nurse and doctor. So how does this work? So let's suppose, Tom, let's suppose you were in this clinic. So, and I'm Dr. Tucker. And there's a few other people in this clinic as well. So she would first go to the first patient and do actually a one-on-one -on -one with that patient. So this is not a lecture that she was doing. So she'd go to Tom and say, OK, Tom, how are you doing? You know, have you taken your medicines? Diagnose, prescribe. Then she'll move on to the next, let's say you were in that clinic again. How are you doing? Diagnose, prescribe. So it's literally a one-on-one -on -one with each patient. But there's seven or eight patients in the room. So this is a very different interaction, if you think about it. How many of you have been in such a shared medical appointment? OK, so occasionally, uh, somebody will raise their hand. So now, when you think about this interaction, it's probably quite obvious to you that Dr. Tucker is going to save some time. Because she's probably going to tell Tom that, hey, Tom, you know, you need to eat in a particular way, et cetera. That same advice is going to be relevant because these are not random patients. They are all patients who are coming for the same ailment. So that's pretty obvious. But what I found far more interesting was that they found that on certain outcomes, this shared appointment concept was far better than the traditional one-on-one -on -one appointment. And one of those outcomes was weight loss. So she found, over time, patients who were going to the shared appointment, if you compared them with other patients in the same hospital, University of Virginia is a huge hospital. They have many uh, cardiac preventive care clinics. If you compared them against others going one-on-one, -on -one, there was greater weight loss in the shared uh, appointments clinic. And the other thing they found is that when they did customer satisfaction surveys, customer satisfaction was going through the roof with these shared appointments. And when I heard these two things, um, I was fascinated by it. And I, I started thinking two things. The first thing I thought was, if a shared appointment can work in healthcare, which is a very personal, touchy-feely, you know, you have this relationship with your doctor, then surely it can work in a lot of other places. And the second thing I started thinking was, are there other dimensions? Because here, essentially, you've taken an interaction and you've changed the numbers. Instead of one-on-one, -on -one, you have the same one provider, but many um, clients. So are there other things about an interaction which you could change and unleash a tremendous amount of value? So at any rate, I started to talk about this shared appointment idea to various 
folks. And one of the people I spoke to was Saul Klein. Uh, some of you may know Saul. He um, was one of the leading uh, partners at Index Ventures. Prior to that, he founded Love Film, those of you who live in the UK, um, and uh, a Netflix type of, type of company. And now he has his, um, his own um, VC fund. And when Saul heard about shared appointments, he said, you know what? We can use this at Index Ventures. I mean, they're a venture, venture capital firm. So uh, you know, how can they? So he said, of course, everyone knows that VC funds invest money in startups. But even more than the funding invested, they give expert advice to the startup. So you have senior partners in the VC fund talking to each startup. And his idea was, why can't we bring a whole lot of tech startups, maybe five or six of them at once, and then do a one-on-one -on -one with each tech startup while the others are listening in? What is your thought on this idea? Would you have any concerns about it? I was a bit worried about, you know, competitor. Why would one tech startup want to share with another? But what Saul said is that there are enough tech startups out there in East London that you can get startups which would actually benefit from hearing each other's concerns, and there would be no competitive issues. So then I started thinking, and you might be thinking, how does this apply to you? You know, this is all great, but, and I started thinking, how does it apply to me? I'm not a venture capitalist. And I also don't have, thankfully, any heart problems. Uh, maybe because I'm not a venture capitalist. <laughs> Actually, I also eat very healthy. And uh, a couple of, um, a few years ago, my younger son, Gautam, and I were sitting at uh, dinner. And, you know, I'm Indian. We were eating a basic dinner, dal and rice. We ate that for dinner, lentils and rice. And then after dinner, we were hanging out in the kitchen. And Gautam opened this uh, box, and he took out two cookies. And he was eating that for dessert. And I was actually still a little bit hungry. So I went and took um, another bowl full of dal. And so then I told Gautam, look, you're eating two cookies for dessert, and I'm eating dal. So who do you think is going to live to be 105? <laughs> So Gautam looks at me, and he, he just looked at me, and he says, I am. That is, he is. So I said, how come, Gautam? And he says, better health care. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I kept thinking about, you know, how does this idea of shared um, interaction um, apply to me? And in fact, uh, around then, we were renovating our house. That's not the block I live on. But we had to, as we were reno renovating our house, we needed to hire an electrician. And you know, a couple of months into the renovation, I realized that there were, in fact, two other houses on the same block that I lived on who were also doing a major renovation. And then I started thinking to myself, imagine if all three of us had hired the same electrician. So first of all, he wouldn't have the excuse of having gotten stuck in London traffic coming from the other client. And secondly, I would know about this guy's skills and his competences from people I already know, my neighbors. You know, that's a very different type of interaction. But then I want you to think about why would you ever call an electrician? Why would you call an electrician? You've probably called one sometime. Why do you call an electrician? Emergency. Emergency. You need to get something done. right? You're trying to solve a problem. So, and in fact, if you think about any service that you avail of, the reason you avail of that service is because you're trying to solve a problem. So why do you use banks? Because you can't just manage your money on your own. You need them to solve that problem of managing your money. Why do you send your kids to school? because you want them to have opportunities, and you feel that that problem of you know, giving them opportunities, you can use help in solving that problem. And um, I like to think of, you know, if you think of a client who has a problem, whether a corporate client or an individual client, they have a problem they're trying to solve, you can think of each entity that helps to solve that problem as having a boundary around it. So your firm may solve some part of that problem. And then the, there may be other firms involved in solving the problem. And maybe the client themselves has to do something. So let me just ask you to think back again to the last time you went to the doctor. 
which you were thinking about a few minutes ago. So when you go to the doctor, the doctor diagnoses and prescribes, and that's their part of solving your problem. But then the doctor may also have said you need some tests, in which case you would go to the hospital, which is a different entity. And they may also have said um, you need some medicines, in which case you'd go to a pharmacy, which is a different entity. All of these are helping to solve your problem. But finally, uh, you would also need to actually take those medicines. So you are also involved in solving your problem. And this, the idea of the boundary is the separation between all of these different entities that help to solve the client's problem. And so this sort of conceptual idea, I, was, uh, I shared uh, some time ago with Scott Cook. Scott is the founder of Intuit. Intuit is a market-leading tax software company in the US, which was founded um, maybe 25 or 30 years ago. And uh, they have uh, products like uh, TurboTax and Quicken. Some of you may know of these. They're, they're tax software products. And when I told um, Scott about this uh, concept of boundaries, he said that he had a, an example from Intuit, which uh, he wanted to share with me. And so basically what he is, so the way the software works is that um, their clients buy the software. And then when the tax deadline is coming around and they're filling their tax forms, they will have questions. So what do you do when you have questions and you bought software? You call Intuit. And then Intuit has these experts who answer the questions. And remember, the taxes come with a deadline, April 15th. And every year, they have this huge pressure of expensive tax advisors needing to answer all these client questions. So about 15 years ago, two engineers, they, were, they had a you know, typical uh, meeting going on in a conference room, 15 or 20 people. And these two um, software engineers uh, raised their hand, one of them, and said, we've got an idea. You know, we're coming into the internet age. So why don't we just create a website and let our clients answer each other's tax questions? So what do you think the reaction would have been to that? <laughs> yeah, exactly. They were laughed out of the room. This is ridiculous, right? But they still, what's the worst that can happen if you've done your taxes wrong? Prison, exactly. <laughs> so I mean, this is a serious liability for a firm to take on. So what did they do? They didn't back off. So these two guys, this is also a story about how innovation can actually happen. They decided that they would do a survey. So they managed to get permission to do a survey of about 1,000 um, clients. And they saw the responses come in. And basically, 99% of the clients said, no way. We do not want to have our questions answered by your other clients. These guys still didn't back off. And I think maybe Scott Cook had something to do with this, because he told me the story. And at that point, he was the, I think, chief innovation officer. He had a title like that for Intuit. But they managed to get a little bit of funding. And they got permission to try this idea in a very narrow market segment, where if it failed, it would not in any way tarnish Intuit's global brand. And when they did it, it was a huge success. So TurboTax Community Live, which they had started, then got um, spread all through into it. And so it worked out tremendously. And if you think about it, what they have done is shifted the boundary. They took a task that they used to do themselves, and they passed it over the boundary to their clients. And the reason I'm sharing this example with you is two reasons. First of all, this is, it was much, um, you know, it was long ago, not today where things are happening more like this. But secondly, that it is a, an area where there's extreme risk. But they've still managed to figure it out. You know, they've figured it out in a way that they minimize the liability risk, and they can use this idea. So I've shared with you two ways that you can change an interaction. You know, one is uh, changing the numbers, and the second is shifting the boundary. And I'd like to share um, two other ways. So this image is hard to view. She's a slum dweller in Bangladesh. But the question I would ask you, I want to ask you is, imagine that you were living in Dhaka in Bangladesh. What is the likelihood that this woman would be banking in the same retail bank that you would be banking at in Dhaka? What do you think? Very low. Maybe zero, right? And this is exactly the same insight that 
um, a guy named Stuart Rutherford had. He's a British architect. He had gone to Bangladesh. And he basically said, she's not going to go to the regular retail bank. So let's take the bank to the slum. And again, this is 20 years ago. So this is not today when we have mobile money and M-Pesa, mobile banking, all of that. This is much earlier. And so what they did is they went to the slum. And this is a company called Safe Save which is just retail banking, not Grameen Bank, which is the very famous bank out of Bangladesh, which is you know, loans for, um, for new businesses. So what did they do? They trained up women who were from the slum and who were well respected for um, doing financial transactions, like for instance, someone who's selling something. They trained them with this little handheld, fairly clunky looking device, and they went door to door in the slum, and they could do transactions as small as one taka. So, uh, borrowing or depositing a taka as a fraction of a penny. So again, and this is a profitable business model. And a big part of what they did is change the location. And location is something that is very fundamental. Every interaction has a location, and it is something that we often don't question. You know, it just is part of, you don't even think about it. You just start to interact, not questioning. And uh, going back to, Tom, what you talked about, you know, that technology um, uh, development um, with the kinds of technologies we have available today, uh, it's actually quite easy to question that assumption about location. Do we have to meet face to face? Or are there other ways to do it? Some of you may have had surgery. And I'm sure all of you have near and dear ones who at some point in their lives have had surgery. If you think about surgery, you are probably, the actual surgery, you, you want to envision in your mind um, a, a doctor who looks you know, very competent and you know, um, doing that surgery, right? Something like this. But let me show you another image which is also surgery. So this is cataract surgery, and this is being done in the biggest eye hospital in the world, the Arvind Eye Hospital. And there are, in fact, the six patients over there being operated on. And the question is, of all those people who are floating around in that room, how many do you think are surgeons in that room? There's two surgeons in that room. And who are all those other people? So those other people are young women between the ages of about 17 and 20. So they have got a high school degree in some science subject. And at, at the age of 20, they will often get married, and then they may not work um, at the hospital. So that's what they've done. And so what they've done is they've taken the cataract surgery, and the surgeon is doing only those parts of the surgery, which only the surgeon has the skill and the experience and the expertise to be able to do. And everything else about the cataract surgery has been distributed to these um, young women. So think about that. What is the worst that can go wrong if something gets messed up in this cataract surgery? Blind. So there's huge downside loss over there. And yet, they have managed to uh, basically rethink and changed how they're organized within the boundary of their organization in such a way that the surgeon's time is being used only for um, the parts that it's necessary. And if I asked you, we don't have time right now, but if I asked you to right now write down a list of all the things that you do every day and then asked you which of these things could be done by somebody else, what percentage? A fairly big chunk. But if I asked you what percentage of the things you do every day could be done better by somebody else, even then, often, it's a big chunk. And so this is about thinking about how you're organized. And what I've done here is I've shared a framework. And um, Elizabeth Teisberg and Amy Tucker and I wrote a Harvard Business Review article about this framework that you can question any interaction by changing the numbers, sh uh, shifting the boundaries, um, shifting the location, which is very fundamental, or changing how you're organized. And what I want to also share with you is that in innovation, it is extremely important to think and. Don't think or. So you've got these four different dimensions, but often very powerful innovations come from combining different 
ideas. <coughs> and let me share with you um, an image here. Many of you may have children and may have been to parent-teacher meetings. And I'm sure your parents went to parent-teacher meetings. And all over the world, this is the typical parent-teacher meeting, right? Have you experienced? Yeah. And you know, you can see everybody's sweating. You know, the parents are sort of stressed out. The teacher is tired talking to one parent after another. The guy sitting in the corridor outside is you know, waiting his turn anxiously. And uh, interestingly, at the uh, school that my two boys study at, a few years ago, we used to have this kind of parent-teacher meeting you know, every few months. But then they decided they were going to change the interaction. So what they did is, so this was for a class where there were 60 children. So they basically invited all 120 parents into the great hall of their school. So it was in a completely different location. And then what they did is, uh, they, had, they had the class teachers sitting on the side on tables. And so you could have a one-on-one -on -one with the class teacher. But all the other teachers, like the Latin teacher, the physics teacher, history teacher, were just standing at different places in this hall. And parents were milling around, and you could go and talk to a teacher. And they had some wine and cheese, which is, which is also nice. <laughs> right. Now, and, so they've also changed um, the numbers in the interaction. Because if you wanted to discuss something very private with one of the teachers, it's, it might be a little harder to do that with others milling around. But to me, what was very fascinating is that they had also managed to change by doing this the boundary of the interaction. Because if you think about what interaction this enables, it is essentially an interaction between the parents and, then the, and the, the teacher. In some countries uh, where you come from, uh, where you may come from, the child is also invited. So then it's the child, the parents, and the teacher. But uh, with this um, interaction being in the great hall, for me as uh, you know, a, a working mom and my, you know, my husband works for, the, uh, for our kind of family, even more important than meeting the Latin teacher would be to have two minutes with the mom or dad of one of our boy's friends. You know, just to touch base, how are they doing, you know, what are they up to, very valuable information that I could glean. And this um, uh, has enabled this interaction. So I would urge you to think about how you can combine um, ideas. And I want to leave you with this question. Can you rethink how you interact?